Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. This show is brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation as well as the Compassionate Friends. Well, Heidi, we're going to talk about coping with cancer today, and we're going to hear a compelling story of a child and a mom and a family mm -hmm. who dealt with such courage with cancer, with childhood cancer. And then we're going to have a professional on, right? Absolutely. And uh, like you said, our first guest will be Sue Matthews. And she and her daughter, Taylor, dealt with this in such a positive way. And they kind of made it fun in a way. And, you know, I know that sounds strange, but Taylor was diagnosed with cancer at 11. She died at 16. Her mom, Sue, is here today, and she's writing a memoir called Paint Your Hair Blue. And I asked her earlier why she chose that, and she said, because somebody called her and said, my daughter has cancer, and what should I do? And she said, have fun with her hair if you can. <laughs> you know, because it's yeah. a stressful time for right, kids, and for you want to sure. take the pressure and the stress off of them. Mm -hmm. um, she's also the founder of a wonderful organization called Conquering Kids Cancer. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see her rolling about what Taylor did, because Taylor, when she was diagnosed with cancer and had cancer, she started creating things and making things and selling them and raise a lot of money for research. Yeah, an amazing story, an amazing story of courage. It really is. And uh, then we're going to talk to a, our friend who we've had on before. We've had her on our radio show, Dr. Wendy Lichtenthal. And Wendy is a clinical psychologist. She is the director of the Bereavement Clinic at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And she is a researcher, and she's doing some really incredible research with bereaved parents on meaning making after loss. Mm -hmm. Great. So. Well, welcome to our show, Thank wonderful mother of Taylor. Hi, Sue. Hi. Yeah. I am. I love being called Taylor's mom. Mm -hmm. I don't think people realize how much we love to hear our kids' names, right? No, we really do. And we keep them alive by talking about them. Absolutely. And they're still around doing great things. Well, tell, tell our audience a little bit about Taylor. Taylor was feisty, a beast, I don't know what to call her, <laughs> now an angel. From the day she was born till the day she died, it was very, she was my second, she is my second daughter. Mm -hmm. And she came out of the womb, her face was scratched with red lines. I looked at the doctor, I, I mean labor, you don't get a beautiful baby, but mm -hmm. it was very strange. And he said to me, she was fighting to come into this world, wow. scratching herself out, and she left this world fighting. Mm -hmm. had no idea that, or we think she had no idea, because she was anticipating going to a Sweet 16 the following week, wow. that she was dying. And she, before she was diagnosed with cancer, during cancer, she just lived every moment of life, mm -hmm. being fun, ha being completely happy, the queen of pranks. <laughs> That's amazing. And you can see that when we show the video later. You, It really comes across, even when she doesn't, I mean, first of all, she's beautiful, and she's... When we say she's this tiny little thing, she's darling, she's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And she's wear she has no hair, but she's wearing the, you know, a do-rag or whatever it is, the bandana, and she's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And she's creating all this art and making all these things, and it's pretty, you can, you can feel her spirit and how mm -hmm. alive she is in that video. I was shocked when I uh, read some of the things about Taylor, about the fact that there'd been nothing done in childhood research for cancer, right? For like the treatments they were using with her were 20 years old or something, is that right? She was diagnosed in 2003 and the treatment protocol for her type of cancer was from the 1970s. Now it's 2016 and that there's no advances and the wow. treatment of her type of cancer. There have been advances in other pediatric cancers. Mm -hmm. But she had bone cancer? Well, she was diagnosed with bone cancer, mm -hmm. okay. and then she was misdiagnosed. And she what type had of cancer was it? Yeah. Cancer of the cartilage, but we didn't find okay. out for three and a half years. Oh my gosh. So there so, wasn't that much on it. So she did these Tay bands. Talk about those. Yeah, it's, well, the name of the foundation is now called Conquering Kids Cancer, mm -hmm. K with a Z, because we had to put cancer and kids in the same name, mm -hmm. but we'll always call it Tay bands. Mm -hmm. That's how she founded it, Tay for Taylor and she was designing headbands. Mm -hmm. She decided to put the B-A-N-D-Z at the end. So many people still call it Tay bands. And she looked at us when she heard the doctor say, you know, we asked a lot of questions and they told us that her protocol was from the 1970s. And she looked at my husband and I and said, you mean the protocol's as old as you and daddy? <laughs> and we were like, unfortunately is. Mm -hmm. and the shock of diagnosis gave way to the reality that pediatric cancer is desperately underfunded. Mm -hmm. 
So her way at 11 years old was to take it into her own hands and open a foundation specifically for pediatric cancer research. And she raised $100,000 and you've gone on? She raised $100,000 and amazing. she didn't understand what $100,000 right. was. Uh -huh. She knew daddy and I, my husband and I were thrilled. You know, when I gave her right. $10 to go get pizza with her friends, <laughs> mm -hmm. she thought that was a huge sum of money. Yeah. And now we've raised about a million five. That's awesome. incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I've continued her foundation. Her legacy lives, and that's tremendously healing for me. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh huh. Now, how do people find you? You can go to the website, taybands, t a y b n d z dot org, or conqueringkidscancer dot org. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So tell us about how you have coped with it, because you've gone on. Is it through the foundation and giving, and what has helped you for folks that are watching? Well, my, it's been quite a journey. It's been eight and a half years now. For the first two years, I didn't get out of bed. Mm -hmm. My husband quit his job. I was very, we were very fortunate that he was able to do that. And my other girls really needed a parent to be completely present, and he was. Mm -hmm. And I'm very sad that I wasn't present for them. I truly don't believe I was, even though they tell me to this day that I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does that sound familiar, Absolutely. Heidi? Absolutely. <laughs> Take their word for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I always say, you know, we, we understand what you were going through. So we're, we give you a lot of slack because, I mean, my parents were going through so much after my brother died, and they felt really bad. They felt like, you know, we could have done a better job, but I was like, you did the best you could. We, we, I saw every day how much it was, devast how devastated they were by it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so, very comforting for me yeah. to hear. So I should believe my girls. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, grief and healing, what changed after that two years is my anxiety before I heard a loud noise and I would jump. Mm -hmm. My anxiety went down tremendously and I was able to engage in life. Mm -hmm. That's great. Now I feel like I can completely engage in life and I'm also, which is very healing, is I'm living the life she would want me to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She would not want me to be sad, sitting in a hole. She would want me out, out having fun, mm -hmm. laughing, doing whatever she would be doing. Mm -hmm. And that's extremely healing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm giving back, which is what she wanted, and mm -hmm. which is naturally extremely healing and therapeutic for others. Mm -hmm. And I'm also working, which is kind of a slippery slope, but I'm working with families, underprivileged families, mm. that have children with cancer as oh, well. Oh, wow. wow. But that's Good a slippery you. slope, because that puts me back on a pediatric onco oncology floor. Uh -huh. Is that difficult to go to the hospital after you've been it's there? It's very difficult to go to the hospital, but the relationships I have with the children are beyond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one one little girl who just turned, not so little, just turned 16, she texts me every day. Wow. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I make arrangements to go to the hospital without even asking her mother. That's mm -hmm. great. You know, I'm just yeah. welcome there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they call me Aunt Sue. Oh, mm -hmm. I love that. I love that you're doing that. And you're able to do that because you've been in that situation. Yeah, believe it or not, the first, besides I run the foundation full time, mm -hmm. but believe it or not, the first volunteer job I took, which is going to sound very odd, after maybe about two and a half years later, is working with hospice. Mm -hmm. mm. Was that healing or no? It put me back in my safety zone. Okay. My, and sadly, my safety <coughs> zone, zone was sickness and death. Mm -hmm. And it, going to the hospital, whether it was going for a checkup or whether Taylor was getting chemo, was a safe place to be. Mm -hmm. You were trying to make her better. Mm -hmm. And it's shocking how much you miss the doctors and nurses mm -hmm. and the facility. It's like you don't go to the mall anymore. You don't do anything of that nature. That's mm -hmm. where you go. Yeah. And that becomes your new normal. Right. Mm -hmm. So I needed to put my myself back in that position. Mm -hmm. And then helping hospice patients, I had one patient in particular, you know, it helped me so much. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and are you still doing Tabans? You are? Yeah, so Tabans, okay. the name changed to Conquering Kids Cancer. Mm -hmm. But you're still creating... Oh, we things. fundraised tremendously. Our annual campaign is just coming up right now. Right, We've um, fund pediatric cancer research. Right now we're funding research at Columbia Medical University, wow. which is genetic sequencing of an individual child's tumor. So it's this no longer amazing. one size fits all. And it only costs five thousand dollars to sequence a child. Wow. And seventy percent when they find the DNA mutation, it changes protocol by seventy percent. They wow. have many children 
that are surviving because they found the DNA mutation and they're able to block it. That's incredible. So you're saving lives. Yeah, which, you know what, what better could you do in Absol this world? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know, and I she, know that your daughter said being of service helped her a lot in her journey. I truly believe the foundation like helped her tremendously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe even kept her alive because she stayed in a really good place and she was, had a meaning, meaning and purpose in her life. Oh, I and completely it, it agree with life. you. It, it extended mm -hmm. her life. Mm -hmm. It gave her tremendous happiness and also was fun. Yeah, it looked like it. Oh you gosh. know, she did things with her friends with it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think I would like to see the Rowan about her. And then uh, when Wendy comes on the show, I want to talk a little bit about the f something that you've hit on that I think is very key for our audience. And that is that taking care of someone who has an illness becomes your job. And when they do die, it is a challenge on that other side. You know, you've kind of lost your purpose in a way, because oh, you've organized your whole life around that. With us, we had a sudden death, so you know you haven't organized your life around it. So, but with those, uh, any kind of an illness like that, and and you and know, you also have a lot of support because you've got the doctors and the nurses and the exactly, social workers. Exactly, and you're talking and about that. And all of a sudden, they're yeah. gone. Yeah, and, and they just the, disappear uh, overnight. Yeah. And your dreams and your hopes, your purpose in life is to save your child. Right, right. Yeah. Your dreams and your hopes mm -hmm. are gone. Well, mm -hmm. let's see that Roland now. And uh, Taylor her. wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> let's I see the Taylor. Roland of Taylor, and then we'll talk. have Wendy come here. There's a simple motto in the Matthews home. Everything's okay if you're with Ty. But Susan and Bob Matthews weren't so sure everything would be okay when their 12-year-old daughter, Taylor, was diagnosed with bone cancer last May. Unbelievable shock, and you don't know what to do. I was sad, scared. Taylor didn't know what was to come, but soon found out. A lot of being sick, a lot of needles, a lot of missing my friends. The extreme generosity and thoughtfulness of her friends helped Taylor get through the first devastating weeks. When I was first in the hospital, my room turned into like a garden. It was so many flowers. Tons of teddy bears followed along with dozens of calls, emails, and cards each day. Songs of love made Taylor her own tune. It made me happy through the whole thing, even when I was really sick in the hospital. This is one of my favorites. Taylor was so overwhelmed by the outpouring of love and support, she felt she had to give back. So with the help of a family friend, she started designing her own accessory line, Tay Bands. It's really fun, first of all, designing and then selling, and then bringing the money to where I want it to go. All the money from the sale of the belts, keychains, necklaces, bags, and headbands goes towards pediatric cancer research. She doesn't want ever, anyone to ever be in the situation that she's in. The designing also helped keep her focus off the chemotherapy. Whenever I didn't feel good, I knew I should go design because then the people who didn't feel well after me would I would be giving back to them, helping research. And there's Taylor with the vomit bucket and the art project right next to it. It's been a little over a year since Taylor was first diagnosed. She's completed high-dose chemotherapy and doctors say she's doing well. Meanwhile, Tay Bands has raised nearly $150,000 towards pediatric cancer research. Knowing that they may be getting treatments that I funded the research for, it's really great. I missed the fifty thousand, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars <laughs> for incredible. research. That's incredible. What and, an you know, amazing thank you. child! What yeah, really. So, so welcome to our show, Wendy. As we said earlier, <clears throat> Wendy Lichtenthal is a clinical psychologist, mm -hmm. and she's doing research and working at Sloan Memorial Cancer Center here in New York City. And you're also doing some pretty groundbreaking research on meaning making after loss with parents. We've been doing. We've did a lot of legwork before what we're doing now, which is actually a, a, ther a therapy, a psychotherapy that mm -hmm. we've developed. Um, so we did a lot of interviewing with parents and getting feedback about something t that would help um, help them learn to coexist with their grief. Um, and I think Taylor exemplifies how to coexist with, with challenges. I like that. Thing. I haven't yeah. heard that comment before, coexist co with your yeah. grief. I like yeah. that a lot. That's Instead of the kind of getting over it or, you know, 100%. what, you know, aren't you over it yet? It's yeah. a, the coexisting. Everything um, that has come together in the intervention that we've developed has been careful, very careful about wording. We've had um, parents gave us input. It's, it's using their input, their feedback, because 
And if you if you haven't experienced it, of course, you, you can't possibly get it. And we recognize that. And so we've taken a lot of what we know from the literature, from the research, from countless theorists um, who have done amazing work that, that speaks to the importance of meaning, mm -hmm. um, finding meaning in one's life and in the loss itself. Um, in helping adjusting to a loss, um, but with parents in particular, we've wanted what helped um, what helped the parents who were who were doing better, and we also interviewed parents who were not who were struggling to understand the struggle better. And now we have a, a program that we're we're examining. What do you think the biggest issue is for parents? Yeah. Just right off the top of your head. One, I mean, with cancer specifically, I think you hit the nail on the head about that that's that sense of meaning and purpose being in the caregiving role, mm -hmm. and then that being gone. And that can be for any space. age. If yeah. someone is watching yeah. for any age, losing mm -hmm. that, yeah. any kind of caregiving, Alzheimer's, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, when you lose that role, it's, yeah. a, it's a huge role. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that piece of it, it and th then the secondary loss of the, the support network, right? So mm -hmm. it's, there are these, mul these multiple losses Except that happen Except I'll have cancer. to say that mm -hmm. um, Hospitals and hospices are doing a little better job or a better job of having groups and things after. Yeah. When it's my son right was on. killed, I actually worked as a psychiatric nursing consultant to a medical center uh -huh. and there was nothing. There was nothing. They're doing a better job, but it needs to even be better. We're yeah. working. I mean, and also when you realize the, the amount of people around someone that's a child that's yeah. dying or that's sick, it's a huge amount. Yeah. I mean, once the child dies, you might have one or two people coming into your life, but you're not going to have a team, yeah. a treatment yeah. team. Yeah, absolutely. So I can see why people are feeling a void. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what are the things that if you said helping would be making meaning out of it? Well, it's, I, I keep coming back to Taylor. Taylor yes. The way Taylor just articulated mm -hmm. what finding something that was purposeful to her, how it helped her transcend and get through this experience extremely difficult time and mm -hmm. that, that's what it's about. It's about figuring out what makes life worth living enough. Mm -hmm. yes. Enough to get out of bed, enough to put one foot in front like of the other. Enough. Yeah, because the, right. whole, mm -hmm. the whole thing about this is that we recognize the, the pain, this is not to eliminate the grief or pain um, for, for parents, it's to figure out how to be with that grief because it is part of the connection to their child and to keep saying their name in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. um, to think about the ways to stay connected, to stay in that role um, by nurturing their child. I mean, you know, Sue, you're, you're nurturing Taylor, you're still oh, mom I'm to still Taylor. Mom. In and, all and, these and ways. Would, would her organization be another way of staying connected? Exactly, okay. exactly that. That being said, and while that, hap that while parents do that, and it's an amazing thing um, when they do, there are other smaller ways. So mm -hmm. sometimes I'm working with someone, and they're like, "I'm not start." You know, I know so many people start a foundation, mm -hmm. or they find these um, very, very impactful ways. Um, there are more subtle ways to stay connected, as you mm -hmm. guys well know. Like and what? what are some? Well, of them? conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and then just taking the spirit. This is also one of the things that's kind of unique about a cancer loss or losing someone um, to, who, who fought with an illness, which is you witness them going through something exceedingly hard. And so take, and, and, who, and these children inspire many. And so one of the things we try to work with with parents is to take that inspiration and use it in just putting one foot in front of the other, making a decision to do something that day, to remember their child and connect um, and, and use their name and say, you did this, huh? All right, all right. I can do it too. I can, you do, can it. do it. Oh, I, I can, can do, do it. it. And yeah. so, um, so that is another way that their child's legacy is continuing, is just understanding what, what your child went through with the illness and using that inspiration to Move through you know, I group. like where you're talking about the small things because yeah. we do mm -hmm. have people on here that are so inspiring right. and they've gone on to do, yeah. you know, like, like you and they've yeah. gone on to do, Sue, this whole thing. But what people, what you need to remember is something that Sue said and that was that two years you could hardly get Absolutely. out of bed. Absolutely. We I mean, see that all the time. Yeah, I, I just think, you know, right away there sometimes can be a burst of energy after that, mm -hmm. after that first period of mm -hmm. being in shock. You, you might say, I've got to yeah. do something or something, and you know, maybe you don't need to do anything, but just right. say their name or whatever. Oh, you know? and Taylor, I do have the legacy of the book coming out. I do help other cancer patients, but in small ways, mm -hmm. she is with me and in my private life. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That's, you know, more therapeutic maybe, 
But in my private life, I stay so connected to her. Mm -hmm. She sends me a lot of signs. Oh, okay. Yes, we that love the signs. Yeah. And so, Wendy, I'm curious. This yeah. is what I see a lot in my private practice. What about the bereaved parent that says, I don't want to let go of the pain because the pain represents my connection to my child. Great point. So the fir in so the way we the therapy that we've developed, it's we systematically hit all of the things that are not all of the things, but many of these themes that come up. Mm -hmm. um, and not all of them are relevant for everyone, but that one certainly mm -hmm. comes up a lot. We hit that right in the start. Um, and we do it through the meaning you make of your feelings, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all about meaning making, but we also make meaning of our grief and part of the meaning of the grief is it's the connection, it's right. the pain. If I let go of this, I won't feel anymore, I mm -hmm. won't remember, um, it's a pathway. And so we think about alternative ways to stay connected mm -hmm. um, that, um, that, and again, it's not about getting rid of the grief, right. it's just about kind of transforming it, transforming that connection and mm -hmm. finding ways, um, and by doing so, often, often because there's such a push-pull with feeling, mm -hmm. uh, what ends up happening is um, people start avoiding the grief because they, they feel like they start busying themselves so much that it's because it's so painful. So whatever is going on, whether it's that they're staying in the grief or kind of um, wanting it to surround them and cocoon them because mm -hmm. it's a connection or whether they're busying themselves so much, we start to work with what does the grief mean to you? What does the pain mean to you? And can we think of other ways to stay connected and to, to think about to think about the feelings. I, so. I like this, and I'm just wondering what are some other ways? So what are some other ways yes, to? That are not about embracing the pain. Well, it's changing, it's just thinking about the pain differently is okay. one way to say that, um, I, I, so I think Sue said it well, yeah. best, which, which is what Taylor would say, what Taylor would say. So we bring the child in, the child's voice in a lot, mm -hmm. is what, so we open up with a conversation with your child in terms of what would your child want for you. Oh, I love um, this. And so that, um, you know, you can remember me and, and these ideas of, of I want to, you know, of course we can still stay connected, but I want you to live your life. I mm -hmm. want that for you. It's almost always there. You know, it's a good, it's a it's something that, that um, it's hard to, to think about, but when we actually have people say it and engage in these conversations, I mean, that's part of why, what therapy can do is it gives you that protected space to mm -hmm. actually do this this work that can be so painful mm -hmm. but so powerful. I think it's a, it, I think that. it's really uh, important, Heidi, when she talks about work. I don't think people realize yeah. that grief, you know, is yeah. is a hard process yeah. and really, you know, dealing with it kind of head on yeah. or whatever yeah. or. Well, I don't know, maybe it's a natural thing and it just happens, not, not trying to block it. But tell me, um, can people, how do they get in touch with you and sure. how do they get in the program and is Thank it you. national and can so, you YouTube or is it Yeah, so we do, so that's a, uh, a good point. So we do the therapy through video conferencing because people have a hard time coming back to uh -huh. the hospital. Uh -huh. And it's open, but it's not just open to individuals who are treated um, at our hospital, it's open to, to bereaved parents. Um, right now, just because of the therapists we have in licensing, we're in New York and New Jersey, mm -hmm. um, but we're ex we're trying to expand that. And as long as we have therapists who are licensed in the state where someone is uh, is um, living at the time of the therapy, we can we can treat them. So you're training people we're around tra the We're trying States. to train people. Okay, how to get, do I find you? I'm so listening to this. Sounds eight, good. Um, so <laughs> you can email aim study. It's A I M study S T U D Y at m s k c c dot org. Okay, oh. maybe we can get that as a, on your lower sure, service sure. there. Sure, sure, you can email that. that if you want more information or even just to find out more resources. We also, when people contact us, we try to hook them up with resources that are local and, and other great. ways of connecting with parents and all of that. Yeah. All right. I Good. wish I knew yeah. when, Wendy hey. eight um, years ago. Yeah, I wish I knew <laughs> Wendy was not doing it eight years ago. That's why I say I think the world of grief and loss, uh, for me, really, there was very little yeah. 30 years ago, and now, yeah. um, you know, yeah. there's a lot more sensitivity to it. Yeah. Now, how do people find you and talk about your fundraising and what you're doing? And I mean, they can go to the website, but you can also just Google Sue Matthews, and the website and everything will come up. That's mm -hmm. kind of an easier way to do it. Uh-huh, okay. And you're having a gala and an event coming up or fundraising mm -hmm. or what's going on? You know what? We have stopped doing our galas mm -hmm. because we find out they are so expensive. Mm -hmm so much work and the end up the money you're making is minimal because mm -hmm. the gala costs yeah, so much yeah, money. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we've stopped doing major events. We're doing much more small smaller mm -hmm. events and primarily most of our 
uh, funds come from directly from donations, and particularly matching donations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you still selling tape bands or no? You know, we stopped selling tape bands. <laughs> <laughs> the designer left us. Mm -hmm. um, we sold them for many years after, mm -hmm. but uh -huh. then when the merchandise dwindled, we decided you know, she was the designer and we didn't mm -hmm. want anyone else yeah. to mm -hmm. be that part, so we changed that part of it. Yeah. yeah. But amazing. which I do everything, even changing the name, because I think she would want mm -hmm. yeah. the best and for us to raise the yeah. most amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And we ra one of the other reasons we raise a lot of money is we're all volunteers. We have no costs. Right. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about if you had a piece of advice for me. We'll start with you, Wendy. Mm -hmm. I've had a child die or a family member die of cancer in the last year. Mm -hmm. What would your advice be to me? I think the first thing that we communicate is give yourself permission to feel whatever it is that you're feeling, to be in bed if you need to be in bed, um, to, to, to take time. And, and um, But the other thing is to, to think about support, to think about professional support. One thing that we've done is we've made a, a video testimonials of people who have come to, to work with us mm -hmm. um, because it is so painful and who wants to go move toward pain? Who mm -hmm. wants to go, go speak with someone where they know the topic of what they're going to be speaking about is going to be that excruciating? Um, but it is work. But, and what we have in these testimonials are people saying it does help. All right, thank so. you for that. And have you got one? One comment that you'd like well, to say? Well, I to totally agree with therapy. Get some. Mm -hmm. I'll never, I'll never leave therapy my entire yeah. life. So get some help, and I want to <laughs> say, if you can't afford, or for some reason you can't find help, make sure you go to the CompassionateFriends.org mm -hmm. and OpenToHope.com. Uh, Compassionate Friends has 700 chapters in yeah. the United States and uh, peer support, and you can find one of those chapters by going to the Compassionate Friends website. And we want to thank you guys for being on the show sure. today. It's been Absolutely. great. Thank and thanks, Wendy and Sue, for thank all you're you doing to us. move the world along and, and help everyone. And, thank you for uh, having us. And Taylor does wonderful work. She, she does. still does wonderful work. Yeah. She absolutely She pushes does. me. Yeah. She's your guiding light. <laughs> She's my guiding light. And just to she mention, really the work is. we're doing is free of charge um, as well. It's all right, research, free of charge, so. too. That's amazing. <laughs> I love it. So thanks for watching the show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you, if you've lost hope, Please lean on ours until you find your own, and God bless.